Hey, everybody. It's the Drive to School podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, and my good friend, Pastor Brad Meyer, is back. How you doing, man? You know, I'm doing pretty good. I didn't get any coffee this morning because the doctor said not to, but, you know, I- I'm sleeping, which I guess makes up for it a little bit. I said, we were talking about this right before we started recording. I've got my cup of coffee like right off screen and I'm going to not take a sip of it in front of you now because I'm trying real hard to be a kinder person. Um, I appreciate that. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, life's, life's pretty good. We've been traveling a little bit, uh, getting to, to see a lot of people. We got to go to symposia, got to go to the March for Life. And so it, it's good to connect with, with old friends. It's good to, to sort of see where the mission actually hits the road and, and where you sort of get to interact with people who don't think like you. And, and that's that's an important thing to kind of sort through. It's actually a little bit of what we were going to talk about today, that that um, there's that sort of old fashioned saying about uh, assumptions that uh, we're probably not going to repeat on a kid's podcast. But when you when you watch TV, when you when you watch movies, when when you you listen to to podcasts, um, sort of the assumptions underlying, uh, they're assuming a certain way of thinking. Um, it's important to, to use reason to sort of figure out whether or not you're, you're sort of jumping off on the wrong foot, because if you're on the wrong foot, you're never going to get to the right place, right? Well, I mean, you might stumble your way in there, but it will be by ap- accident, not by intention. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have very good balance. So the only place I ever get is when I, you know, I never <laughs> intend to go anywhere I go. I just, it just happens sometimes. Uh, anyways, that's a conversation for another day. No, that's, I mean, that's really where you have to start though. When it comes to consuming media, the news, uh, movies, whatever, they're all making assumptions. You know, they're the axioms, right? These basic foundational okay. principles they assume to be true about the world. And I think typically, you know, in in the Western world, we have general things that we agree about that are true, um, but not always, right? Especially as we see the the increase of secularism and these these all these isms, these anti Christian isms, leftism, communism, socialism, secularism, you know, uh, whatever. I mean, you can go down the list. There's a lot of them, and for whatever reason, all mine were left wing ones, but there are right wing ones too. But all these isms show up. And as they deviate away from the Christian consensus of the West that we sort of built here, um, we're going to start seeing more and more that we're going to have different foundational principles at play when we, you know, say things, when we interpret reality, when we, you know, relate activities and events that happen in the society around us. Right. This so, makes a lot of sense. But um, what if just sort of for the the, the case of, of of our concrete thinkers out there, give me an example of one. Like, let, let's point at a, a pretty clear contender here and just sort of say, why is this different thinking and, and how is it dangerous? Well, one of the big ones, I, I, it's always the sixth command and stuff. That's such a oh, long route because everybody it's the thing. Everybody's talking about sex these days. But that's the big one, the sixth commandment stuff. Right. Okay. Um, so for us Christians, what is the purpose of sex? Mm. Right. Sex is part of marriage. It's geared toward engendering life. Everything that God makes is for life and, and goodness and salvation and joy and all these sorts of things, right? And so why do we have marriage? Marriage makes families. Families make life, not just children, but obviously centered on children, but also the life of having enjoyment and, you know, uh, contentedness and all this stuff with your wife or your husband. So sex has a purpose, right? Mm-hmm. Sex fits into a, a social framework where we have um, life and we have joy and we have goodness that are created by a properly using sex. There's no hurt feelings. There's no diseases. There's none of these problems, right? Now compare that to the secular view of sex. What's the purpose of sex? Well, it's a recreational activity. It's something I do because it makes me happy. It's all about me. See, in the Christian view, everything, six commandment stuff included, is meant to be sacrificially done for the sake of the other, right? So when it comes to sex, I'm supposed to, you know, serve my wife, right? And I'm not supposed mm-hmm. to be into it for my own selfish needs and my own selfish wants. It's completely inverted in the secular view. So what is sex all about if I'm a secularist? Well, it's me getting my pleasure and using other people as as sex tools, as toys, as as objects. For it actually people. turns competitive. It, 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 it turns into a sport of, of, of sort. And um, yeah, so he, here's uh, even just sort of a simple reality of it. Not only is it, is it um, given by God, but but he, he bestows great power on it. And this is a place where um, even the, the secular world sort of recognizes this. So they talk about safe sex, uh, which is just the recognition that there can be dangerous sex. Um, if, if it's safe or dangerous, what we can even contend with is that there's power behind there. And so if you're using it for good, good things can come. And if you're using it for evil, well, bad things will, bad things will come from that. And, and this right. isn't even talking about whether or not you have a soul a, a, and sex can be good or bad for your soul. Right. And that's the other thing too. So we already hit on two assumptions that are different between Christians and seculars. We believe that we are not purely material objects, right? Mm-hmm. So we believe that we are body and soul together. And that is what makes me, me and you, you and everyone themselves. 
the secularist believes, uh, generally speaking, we're more or less a, a meat bag with chemical reactions and maybe some electrical discharges in my, my neurons, right? That's what makes me me, is I'm just a random happenstance of assembled matter that has some sort of probably an illusion of consciousness, but you know, I, I'm not really a, a being that transcends my own physical self, right? I'm not a being that, that has something more to me than what can be seen and felt. I'm literally, in the secular view, just a sum total of the chemical reactions of my person. That's it. And so right there, we have two major differences, two major assumptions. So then let's say you flip on the news and we're talking about, um, oh, I don't know, Pride Month or year or six months. Or it's, it's getting longer all the time. But, you know, we're talking about Pride Month, let's say. And uh, there's a pride parade in town and the news is reporting on it. If it's a Christian reporting on it, how are they going to approach it? Well, they're going to see this as an offense. We're going to see this as something even blasphemous because it's an attack against what God has constructed, right? We're going to see this as something unhealthy, as not good, because it doesn't fit into these frameworks that God has provided that give us, you know, uh, provide for our flourishing and our goodness and our joy in life. Now, imagine that you're a secularist and you report on this. You're going to see this as great because hey, man, you're just a pile of cells and chemical reactions, and you're going to die one day, and that's all there is, and you might as well have as much fun along the way. And so, you know, all the people out there, they're having fun. They look like they're having fun. They're wearing wild costumes. They're, you know, doing all this decadent stuff. And hey, man, we all love a little decadence. That's why uh, you know, that's why people like their raunchy movies and why pornography is one of the largest industries in this country. You know, it's a huge thing online. So, I mean, you grab this then and, and you get to sort of ask real questions though, because it, your assumptions that you carry into this is whether or not it's hurting somebody. Um, and, and this is always sort of the, the, the first line is, is, is this a victimless crime? And again, the assumptions that you carry into this are going to lead you into very different places. And, and even just sort of, well, um, is suicidality higher among any of these groups? Um, is, are, are um, the likelihood of, of uh, multiple partners because of heartbreak? Um, and, and the word for this then is, is divorce like are people being sort of torn apart in ways that that are not healthy um now now obviously you can't divorce what was not married please hear me the right way but at the same time like if sin is actually breaking stuff and you're trying very hard to not see what's broken you can say nothing's hurt but well god is right about the fourth commandment it, it's it's better when we we aren't fighting with our fam our parents uh, the fifth commandment i like not getting stabbed uh, i'll skip the sixth go to the seventh i like my stuff not took i like not being spoken ill about maybe he's onto something about this sixth commandment stuff well you know that's that's really the hard problem is as we become more pagan as a society there's two things that pagans always go back to is human sacrifice and sex Mm. Um, you got you got to buy the gods off somehow, and for whatever reason, we decide the gods are really happy when we have orgies and when we kill our babies, especially children. Um, there's just something about that. And if you look at the way we've gone, I mean, you know, you were just at the pride uh, pride march, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> march for life, <laughs> wrong march. You were at that other march, uh, the the march for life. You're right. Why do we have one? Because we've killed untold millions of babies in this country at the altar of convenience, at the altar of career, at the altar of you know, my own personal satisfaction. And I mean, that's that's really the big big assumption there, right? You know, Augustine said that sin is curved inward on oneself, like focusing on myself, that's what sin is. And this is our sort of natural disposition. Well, this has been sort of defended academically when it comes to gender theory, when it comes to a, a lot of uh, a lot of the feminist theory that, you know, goes with some, it's not all, you know, talking about women's rights and stuff, but there are certain versions of it that aren't compatible with Christianity uh, because they make it about me and my perceived needs and what I want to assert myself to be in the world. Our assumption, as scripture teaches, is that we actually conform ourselves to God, to the image of Christ, to what he makes us to be through his word, right? And we actually are supposed to, as Luther says in the Catechism, daily drown my old Adam, you know, my old sinful self with all of its selfish ambition. I'm supposed to drown that every day and instead let a new man righteously live forth, right? Right. And there is a law and a gospel approach to this because first we are to, to strive against sin. Like there, there is no way around it. You, you as a Christian who, who have been given life and holiness in the Lord, strive towards these. It, it, it is not a debate. Um, but to the second hand, I, I lose that that struggle every single day. And so when you go to like the March for Life, it, it, it's not just a march to, to point out what's wrong, but at the same time, like, can we, at, is there any hope to point to? Because the assumptions that, that are being made a, 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 on the other side of this are simply that if you are inconvenienced, it's bad. And if things are convenient, it's fine. But then what do you do with the fact that mental health is still 
a, a big struggle for for these these people who have endured this that guilt and shame plague even the people who who bite full into the assumptions of, of, of the world and and is there is there offer is there an offer of hope of forgiveness of, of salvation in, in Christ and so this is also a gospel discussion because quite frankly if you would have no sin then then having a savior doesn't make a whole lot of sense right you know this is this is one of the things that's really hard because Again, here's another foundational difference between Christians and secularists, right? And I'm, I'm being broad here about seculars, but um, we are not afraid of the truth because Christ is the truth with a capital T. He says this in John. Well, I'm not afraid of the truth. In fact, when I confess, I'm just stating the truth. I'm stating the truth about God. I'm stating the truth about myself. And that means that I can be honest about myself. You know, one of the things that's really hard for people because our sinful old self wants to justify himself all the time is to admit when I've done wrong and ask for forgiveness. I see it in myself. I see it in my kids. I see it all the time. And by God's grace, once in a while, I actually admit that I'm wrong and ask for forgiveness. And once in a while, by God's grace, people actually give me the forgiveness that I ask for, right? Uh, but look at this on the other side. In the secular world, you know, what do I do when I make a mistake? I mean, look at politicians. What do they do? They justify, they deflect, they lie, they try to weasel their way out of it, they get their buddies to give them a pass, but nobody wants to admit they made a mistake and, made, and say they're sorry. Well, See, if there's not, not forgiveness, you have to. This is life or death at this point in time. Right. Because this is the danger with this, this, this false justification, right? It, you set yourself up at a certain place, you make yourself about a certain attribute, use your intelligence, your integrity, um, your athleticism, whatever it may be, that's your identity, that's your definition. And when something points out that you're not perfect at that, when you've sinned using that thing, which you're so proud of, um, you can't admit you're wrong because it causes the whole house of cards to come down, right? right. And uh, that's really the problem is that uh, is that the world is afraid of truth. It can't see itself for what it is. And that's why we need Christ in his law and his gospel to come in and just shatter these illusions that we have. And again, as Christians, we're not afraid of this. We're not afraid of of being confronted with who we are, really who we are. Because there's a lot of stuff that we try to hide from other people, even hide from ourselves. And God sees it all quite plainly, and he's not afraid to come and love us and give us his salvation in life. Um, we're, we're afraid to, to show that. We're afraid of what people would think of us. And, you know, like you and I were, were talking before this video, uh, we both have heard confessions. And I got to tell you, I've heard enough that I don't hear anything that surprises me anymore. I don't. Yeah. And the stuff that people freak out about, I kind of raise an eyebrow. But really, that's 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 wow. OK, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you're confessing that, but I didn't think it was. I'm bored by your sin. I'm, I'm bored, so sorry, yeah, but boring. I'm bored by your sin. The evil um, is boring. <laughs> it really is. It, it really There are 10 ways to, to do this thing. There are 10. And, and I've, I've, I've seen them all. And like the, the flavor might shift just a, a hair, but Christ has died for all of them. And that's what I want to talk about. Like I, I, we, we want to strive away from this because it's not helping you. It's hurting you. But, but at the same time, like you have not found a, a such a creative way to wreck your life that, that, um, that the church has not readily and, and mercifully forgiven it before because Christ has bled for her and for you. Right. I think we're getting a little off content, uh, uh, off topic here, but <laughs> it's a good topic to, to veer onto though, but it, it's sort of a recognition sure. though, because it is the other side of that coin that um, even the inside of the church where we hold to these ideals, we hold to our doctrine, we hold to our, our truth, our purity, our, our hope, our, our, our sacred lives. And, and all of them matter. They are all good things. And we we're talking about this beforehand too, that we can fall in, any and every single one of those, e e even the, the clergy. And so thanks be to God, the church is not built on us always having the perfect understanding or, or always having the perfect life, but in Christ who has bled, died, and, and risen from the grave. You know, I, I, I've i told several lay people in my church that I've taken to like district conventions and stuff like that. They always get done. I said, so what do you think of all the pastors? And they kind of say something very nice. And I said, you know, Would you actually it was up to the pastors it? to build the church. We'd be in a lot of trouble. So... <laughs> Oh, we're I'm glad it was here before me. I'm glad it'll be here after me because I'm right. glad it rests on Jesus. And that's the assumption that, that we carry forward. And, and it's a different, uh, you can use a worldview. You can use the word assumption. Um, you had axiom in there, but the, the, the assumption, the, the, the understanding, the beliefs that you carry in are going to shape how you approach the whole thing. And so if you're watching a media that, that's carrying a completely different set of beliefs, I, I'm not saying even avoid it, but just sort of recognize it as you're going in because they're obviously going to come to different conclusions because they're working with different beliefs. Right. And it's interesting, too, how things get filtered, you know, when mm. we approach stuff with our different beliefs. So um, if you believe a certain way, you're more inclined to promote causes, say you're a reporter. And this is just human nature, right? If I'm a reporter and I see something in the news that appeals to me on a personal level, 
I'm going to be more likely to promote that in a way that's you know good for my side. I'm going to be more likely to gloss over, ignore things that make my ideas look bad. It's just that's just how we filter stuff. We do the same thing when we talk to people about stuff we see on the news. You know, it's just it's human nature. It's a bias confirmation is the real thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's just we we just do it, right? And uh, it's something to watch out for though, because uh, a lot of times it leads us to having blind spots. And in people who produce our our movies and our entertainment and our news articles they have the same blind spots we do. They have the same shortcomings. They have the same um, ideological blindness that we can have. And it's, it's a perfectly good thing for us to realize when we go into stuff that this happens, even to really well-paid people who make things in Hollywood with billion dollar movie budgets, right? Just as like it happens to your grandma, you know, uh, mm-hmm. who lives in the middle of nowhere in Kansas or whatever, right? We all suffer from the same sort of stuff and having a, a big job and a fancy title and a bunch of money doesn't change that. Fair enough. So, I mean, we've been talking about philosophy, and this is why. Think. Think about this based on the, the things you know to be good, true, and beautiful. A- and here, then, when you start to approach these other things, you believe, it, it'll come unraveled so fast. A- and then you can you can enjoy the story for the sake of it being a story if you really want to. But, like, also, it's, it's, it stops being then a, a, a purveyor of a different truth. That's good. You know, there's a couple things I would throw out there just as a kind of a sniff test, right? You get yeah, a, you got right. a kind of a, I, I would say, well, a BS detector. Uh, we'll yeah. let people figure out that. We got to kind of develop one when it comes to media, especially the news. Hmm. And some of the things to look out for are, are they, you know, when they're presenting stuff to you, are they using fallacious reasoning? And I know you've done videos on the fallacies. So, you know, I would encourage people to double check them. If you see that kind of reasoning, that tells you something might be a little bit off here, be a little skeptical. If it feels like there's missing context, you know, especially with the news. If you feel like you're only getting one side that is really heavily slanted one way. So, you know, you can watch MSNBC and you can go watch Fox News, right? And you can get two very different angles on the same story because one side skews one way and one side skews the other. And, uh, you you know, you, you're missing context that's not helpful. Um, another thing is when everything is just reduced to emotions and how people feel. And you're not talking about the facts of who went where and did what, Right. Yeah, that's what the news is about. We're supposed to know the basic gist of things. And if all you hear is, well, I'm really outraged, blah, blah, blah. This is not helpful. It doesn't necessarily move you any closer to the truth of the matter. Um, You know, and with others, things like, you know, one sided portrayals. And my personal favorite smell test on this is um, if something feels too convenient to ratify something that I believe. Yeah, then I'm skeptical of it. Like if I hear a news story, if I see something on Facebook and it just fits so perfectly into what I think about the world. That makes me skeptical. And and this is probably because I have a degree in philosophy and I'm an obnoxious person who overly thinks about stuff. But uh, I just, I'm skeptical when things confirm what I believe too easily. You know, sometimes it's true. And most of the time it's just my wishful thinking, you know? (laughs) I get that. But like, at at the same time, like I I get that. I I think that I'm right about everything because it's hard to work your way through life assuming that you're wrong about everything. But at the same time, like there's enough nuance and there's enough gray areas and there's enough challenges to it because the world is, is, well, corrupted by sin that not everything is going to perfectly fit into your your belief system in, in this way that just you checks a box there's going to be something to struggle with and if there's not if it's just too good to be true well well this is the thing right christ and his word are very clear very clear um you know 10 commandments you want to learn how to live your life go read the 10 commandments you know don't do what they say not to do do what they tell you should do check the mm-hmm. catechism out um, and you'll spend the rest of your life working on it and then you'll die someday and be raised again and do it well. <laughs> but, God be praised. Looking forward to it. Really for looking forward to it. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm getting tired of this, this balding head and, you know, sinful disposition. Um, but, uh, we live in this world of complexity, the complexity and chaos caused by sin. So Christ and his word crystal clear, but we don't see all the angles. We don't see all the nuance. And that's why again, and again, you know, like Romans 12 has been in the lectionary last couple of weeks for us, one year guys, and uh, what does Paul say? Love your enemies. And he gives this general impression. Be patient with them. Be kind to them. Love them. Treat them well. Feed them. Why do you do this to your enemy? Well, you don't know why he did what he did, right? I mean, you don't know what's going on in his head. You don't know what was what the motivation was. You don't know anything about this other than what he did. And what he did might be objectively wrong, but it might not be quite as you know malicious and one-sidedly evil as you think it is. Absolutely. Right? And, and that's just something we need to be careful of. That's why vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Right? Right. I can't I can't do that. I have to trust that God's going to set all this stuff right. And and let's be honest, we don't really want anyone to have God's vengeance. That's why uh, we, we look to Christ and how he gives yeah. us unfairly, I might add, uh, life and salvation that we didn't earn. 
Pastor Brad Meyer, thank you so much for joining us today. That well, was my pleasure. Hey, take care, man.